Above us, you can see the Victorian water tanks that they used. Uh, not actually very big, so it would only take a couple of hours to fill them up, at which point they would just drain them and start filling them again. Mind your head. To Matilda's room. So this room is named after Empress Matilda. She was the granddaughter of William the Conqueror and the daughter of King Henry I. Now Henry I had a bit of a problem. He did not have any surviving sons to take over as king after he died. And he took the very unusual step of naming his daughter as his successor. Now to put this in context, this was the 1100s. Women were third, fourth class citizens at best, generally regarded as the property of their husbands. So it really was very, very unusual to name his daughter uh, as his successor. Willie, um, Matilda was married for the first time at the age of just 13. She was married to the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry V. This is why she had the title Empress Matilda. She kept the title even though she was widowed at the age of just 26. She was then betrothed again, this time to a French count called Geoffrey of Anjou. At the time of the betrothal, he was half her age. She was 26, he was 13. But she was not best pleased with this match. Um, but after much persuasion from her father, she agreed to the marriage, went over to France to live with her new husband. A few years later, she was recovering from the birth of her second child when she heard the news of the death of her father. Now, this should have meant that she was now Queen, Queen Matilda. But, taking advantage of the fact that she was out of the country, her cousin Stephen seized control of the throne for himself. Now, he was also a grandchild of William the Conqueror. He was a man, and he was physically present in the country. And those three things together were more than enough to persuade enough lords to switch over their allegiance to him. Matilda did not take this lying down. She raised an army and came over to England. And this began a period of civil war known as the Anarchy, which lasted for 15 years. In 1142, Stephen quite unexpectedly defeated Matilda in a battle near Winchester. Matilda and the remains of her defeated army retreated here to Oxford Castle. Stephen followed close behind, surrounded the castle and laid siege to it. Now they were able to survive inside the castle under siege for three months, September until December. But it got to December and it was a long, cold winter. They were running out of food. It looked like the castle could be captured at any point. So Matilda decided it was time to make a break for it trying to escape. So on Christmas Eve, she called three of her loyal knights to her chamber. They dressed all in white to disguise themselves against the snow. Then they tied the bed sheets together, climbed out of the window, and lowered themselves down to the ground. On reaching the ground, they walked backwards through the snow, so their footprints appeared to head towards the town. They then managed to sneak past King Stephen's army. It was Christmas Eve. There may have been a little bit too much celebrating going on in the ranks. They then made their way to the river, where the story goes... Now be very careful with this phrase, the story goes. What it usually means is what I'm about to say is a total exaggeration. Never really happened at all, but makes a good story. So, the story goes that when they reached the river, they found it frozen solid. And so, using ice skates, which they made from the leg bones of horses. They skated their way to freedom all the way along the frozen river Thames. As I say, 
possibly a mildly romanticised version of what actually happened. Um, the war carried on. It carried on for another 10 years. And at the end of that, they'd all just had enough. They reached a truce. It was agreed that Stephen would remain as king for the rest of his life. And that he would be succeeded, not by Matilda herself, but by her now grown-up son. Coincidentally, or possibly not, Stephen died just the following year. And so Matilda definitely got the last line. Never officially crowned as queen herself, she did get to see her son crowned as King Henry II. He was the first of the Plantagenet kings, and this was a dynasty which lasted for 300 more years. So not the first queen, but a very important, influential figure in early English history. So we're going to continue our way now to the top of the tower. When we get to the top, we have two more low doorways to go through. So do be very, very careful. Once you've ducked through the first one, don't stand up too quickly. It's the second one that catches people, just about here, usually. Uh, and it is low enough for me to bang my head, so pretty much all of you do need to be careful. Yeah. My place at the top of the tower. Heading six. Wow. This, this one's my third time today. Wow. Like muscles of steel. <laughs> Well, I will be forming a ball, so I will be rolling quite quickly. <laughs> Welcome to St. George's Chapel Crypt. So originally above us there was a church called St. George's, built in 1074 by Robert Doyley who built the castle. Uh, now Doyley wasn't really a very religious man, but one night he had a nightmare. And in his nightmare he had a vision, a vision of the Virgin Mary standing at the foot of his bed, pointing downward. And his interpretation of this dream was that he was, it was a message from God telling him he was destined to go to hell if he did not mend his wicked ways. Now, he was Lord of Oxford. He had quite a nice life. He didn't really want to give it all up, become religious and start praying. So what he did instead was he built a church so that all the prayers said in that church would go towards saving his soul. But this was not just a place of prayer. This is Oxford. It was a place of learning and study as well. And it was, in fact, the first institute of higher education in Oxford, over a hundred years before the founding of the university. Um, now, I've mentioned a few buildings now which you can't actually see anymore. There is no church above us. Um, most of the Mott and Bailey Castle has long since gone. Um, all these buildings were destroyed in the middle of the 17th century. So in the 1640s, we had another period of civil war in English history, uh, known as the English Civil War. Uh, there was the Royalists and Charles I on one side, Oliver Cromwell and the Parliamentarians on the other. Oxford was a Royalist town. For most of the war, it was actually the Royalist capital. Charles I stayed here. But the upshot of all this was at the end of the war, we were on the losing side. And so the parliamentarians decided that Oxford Castle, along with many other castles around the country, 
should be destroyed so that the royalists could never use them again. So they set about blowing up the castle with gunpowder. So that's why most of it is no longer here. Now the reason the tower that we've climbed is still there is because there used to be a water mill at the base and that helped provide food for the town. This crypt was buried underneath all the rubble and it was forgotten about for over, uh, for over for another 150 years. Then in the 1790s, a man called Daniel Harris was governor of the prison and he was building a new wing to his prison, a uh, D-wing, and that's what is above us now. Obviously, he wasn't doing the work himself. He had prisoners to do that. So the prisoners were down here digging to lay the foundations and they discovered this crypt. Now, fortunately for posterity, Daniel Harris was much more interested in preserving history than Oliver Cromwell had been. He realised that what they discovered down here was the remains of this long-forgotten Norman church. So the prisoners were set to work excavating the crypt and, in fact, extending it further as well. So this is actually quite a lot bigger than the original crypt would have been. Now, I warned you before you came in about the flooring here. The reason the floor is so uneven is because it was laid by the prisoners. They were learning as they were going along, didn't really know what they were doing, and they didn't do a very good job of it. They did, though, do a better job of the extension to the crypt. Uh, so I don't know if you notice, whenever I talk about the crypt, I always point over this way, and that's because this is the extension to the crypt. So these two pillars here, this one and that one, these were built in the 1790s by prisoners. Uh, they're strong, they're sturdy, they've held up that ceiling for well over 200 years. They are perfectly functional, but also rather plain, especially when you compare them to these ones. These four pillars in the middle, these are the original, the original Norman pillars, over 950 years old. And even after all that time, you can still see this elaborate carving on them. Norman stone masonry at its finest. Originally, they would have been very brightly painted as well, very beautiful, very decorative. Seems a little bit over the top, really, because most of the people coming down here would certainly not have appreciated the beauty. Because, oh, oh are you all right, sir? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Oh dear. So this was, and there we have evidence of it, this was originally used as a storage room for dead bodies, and for that reason it's said that this is one of the most haunted rooms in Oxford. So maybe we just saw some real activity <laughs> there. Really um, so if you want to come back down at the end of the tour and do some ghost hunting, you are more than welcome. Uh, but now we're going to go upstairs, we're going to go to D-Wing, um, and I'm going to tell you about some of the prisoners who've stayed here, and some of the rather unpleasant things that have happened to them, and the people around them. So if you'd like to follow me once more. So instead of Thai ghost, it's now tea ghost. Yes. This is why we have two doors, two windows. There would have been a wall straight across the middle, dividing it into two. Um, we've opened it out so we can get a few more visitors in. Uh, but I'm actually going to take you back 200 years before this part of the prison was built uh, to when the castle was still standing and the first Elizabethan era. So in 1577, Queen Elizabeth I was on the throne of England. 
Living in Oxford, there was a bookseller called Roland Jenks. Jenks was a Roman Catholic. This was not the healthiest of things to be during the reign of Protestant Queen Elizabeth. Jenks made no secret about his religion, and in fact he used his bookselling business to distribute anti-Protestant pamphlets. And he said some rather rude things about the Queen. Not a good idea. Freedom of speech was not what it is today. He was arrested, brought here to the castle, and then later taken for trial. And at his trial, he was found guilty of sedition and having a foul and saucy mouth. This was the genuine indictment. I think saucy must have had a slightly stronger meaning in the 16th century. Um, so he was sentenced to be pilloried by the ears for three days. Now, this lovely device here is called a pillory. And the way it works is very simple. The frame opens up, the prisoner's head goes through the large hole, his hands go through the two small holes. The frame is locked, his hands are chained in, manacled in. It is very uncomfortable. Even after an hour or two, your legs, your back, your neck would really, really start to ache. And this frame, was placed in a public area, middle of the town square, where everybody could see the prisoner, point at him, laugh at him, and of course, throw things. So they would throw rotten vegetables, dead rats, animal dung, anything that made a good splat when it hit. Now, James's crime was sedition. This is very serious. It's up there with treason. Um, so he wasn't just sentenced to this humiliation. His sentence involved a lot of pain as well. He was sentenced to be pilloried by the ears. And what that means is once he was locked in the frame, the guard would stretch out the prisoner's ears, take a hammer and two nails, and nail his ears to the frame. Ow. That's not the worst part. At the end of the three days, they did not just pull out the nails and let the prisoner go. That would be far too kind. What they did was, they unlocked the frame. They handed the prisoner a knife. And with that knife, he had to cut his own way free. He had to slice off his own ears to be able to walk away. His ears would be left nailed to the frame. As a warning, don't say rude things about the Queen. The criminal himself would then be disfigured, earmarked as a criminal for the rest of his life. So you can imagine, at his trial, when Jenks was given this sentence, he was told what was to happen to him, he was a little bit angry. And he started screaming and shouting, and he was ranting and raving at the court, and he used that foul and saucy mouth of his, and he cursed everybody in the courtroom. And within a couple of weeks... 600 rich men of Oxford had become ill with some mysterious disease. Uh, only rich men. No women, no children, no poor people. 300 of them died. Many driven insane by this disease. And the dead included members of the jury from the trial. Two judges, the coroner and the high sheriff of Oxford. So everybody believed this was Jenks's curse. It had come true. If you're a Catholic, hey, it's God's revenge on those horrible Protestants. But if you're a Protestant and in charge, then it was a Catholic conspiracy. It was Popish sorcery, witchcraft. So by this stage, Jenks has lost his ears. He's now facing the prospect of yet another trial, this time for witchcraft. He really didn't want to lose anything else. So he ran away. He left Oxford, left the country, in fact. Went to live in Flanders, modern-day Belgium. Lived out the rest of his life peacefully, happily, as a baker. Back in Oxford, they believed that the courtroom itself was cursed, and it was never used again. Now, modern-day historians don't like explanations like curses and witchcraft. They think that what actually happened is that while he was here at the castle, there was an outbreak of typhus also known as jail fever, because of how common it was in the prisons. They think that Jenks contracted this disease while he was here, and then while he was in the courtroom, shouting, spitting on people, breathing on them, he passed on the disease. And the reason it was only rich men who caught it 
was because they were the important people. They were the only ones allowed in the courtroom. So this goes part of the way to explaining what happened. But these rich men, they did not drop dead straight away in the courtroom. They went home first to their wives, their children, their servants. And yet we only have reports of rich men dying. Um, was there something in the curse? Or slightly more blandly and boringly. And I apologise to most, to at least half the people in the room. Maybe the disease was more widespread. It just wasn't worth reporting the deaths of these unimportant people like women and children and poor people. Um, so we're going to move along the corridor now. We're going to move forward in time another 200 years, this time to the Georgian era. Uh, and I've got a much more pleasantly decorated cell for you. And I'm going to tell you a love story. It is prison. It's not going to end well. <laughs> Follow me. Were privately run businesses. They were money-making enterprises. And the way they made their money was very simple. They charged the prisoners to stay here. So prisoners had to pay for their accommodation. There was a, a flat fee which covered accommodation and a small amount of food. Now, if they wanted any extras, like some nice furniture, a bed and some bedding, they could have pretty much whatever they wanted if they could pay for it. It was a really, really corrupt system. Prisoners were milked for every penny they had. Um, so this would definitely be the cell of a rich prisoner. Um, now, one rich young woman who ended up here was this lady here. This is Mary Blandy. Mary came from the town of Henley-on-Thames, uh, not far from Oxford, famous these days for the Henley Regatta. Uh, Mary's father was the town clerk, so she was quite a well-to-do, upper-middle-class young woman. But there was something a little bit shocking about Mary. Brace yourself. She was 30 years old. And not married! Oh. <laughs> and shocking and <laughs> terrible. So her loving father decided it would be a very, very good idea to advertise her. So he went round telling people that whoever married his daughter would receive a dowry of £10,000. Not a bad sum of money. In modern terms, that would be worth about £2.4 So you can imagine, plain old Mary Blandy suddenly became very, very attractive. Uh, lots of men were after her all of a sudden. And one of these potential suitors was a, a Scottish army officer called Captain William Cranston. Now he came to Henley on Thames. He courted Mary. She fell head over heels in love with him. It was terribly romantic. It was going to be a beautiful wedding. Oh, it was like the, a season finale to Bridgerton. But then unfortunately, her father discovered that William was already married and had two children back home in Scotland. He was thrown out of the house, never allowed to see Mary again. But they didn't let that stop them. William and Mary continued to correspond in secret. They sent love letters to each other. Now Mary's version of what happened next is that along with one of these letters, William sent a small bottle containing a white powder. And in his letter, he said that this white powder was a love potion. And if she gave it to her father, he would fall in love with the idea of William and Mary getting married. So she put this in her father's food, he changed his mind, they got married, they lived happily ever after. <laughs> no, 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 of course not. She put this in her father's food, he started to lose his hair, his eyes went yellow, his skin went blotchy, his teeth fell out, and eventually he died. Now the servants in the Blandy household were very, very suspicious of their mistress Mary, because they'd seen her in the kitchen, interfering with her father's food. So they reported her to the authorities, and one of the first ever autopsies in the country was performed on Francis Blandy's body, and they discovered that he had died of arsenic poisoning. Mary was almost lynched by the people of Henley, because her father was quite a well-liked man. She was arrested and brought here to Oxford Prison. Now, the prison authorities must have thought, hey, we've hit the jackpot here. How can much can we make from this one? So when Mary arrived here, she never even saw the inside of a cell. 
Instead, she stayed in the prison governor's own house. There, she had two rooms to herself. She was allowed to bring a maid servant to look after her. She had tea parties while she was here. She even had a great big Christmas party. But then it came time for her trial, and no amount of money could save her. She was found guilty of patricide, murdering her father, and she was sentenced to be executed. And she was hanged in public by the mound outside, and it's said that her ghost still haunts the mound, a handkerchief covering her face to hide her shame. Now, I will leave this for you to decide. Is this the face of a naive, innocent young woman, slightly stupid, rather gullible, who was deceived by this sweet-talking, silver-tongued Scotsman? Or did she know exactly what she was doing? Was she determined to get rid of her father, for spoiling her last chance of love and happiness? Your choice in time. Now, looking round the room, I see a lot of criminal looking faces. So I'm going to take you forward now to my era, the Victorian era. I'm going to process you as prisoners, take your mugshots, and tell you about life in Victorian prison. Now, as we walk along this corridor, to your right, you will see a single cell, as it would have been in Victorian times, complete with metal bed, which is not nearly as comfortable as that one. Um, it's far too small for all of us to go in, but you're welcome to have a look. You can come back down at the end of the tour. Uh, and a lot of people have said, walking down this corridor, that they think they can hear the sound of the gallows, like the opening of a trap door, the drop, and then the creaking of a rope as a body swings back and forth. So listen out for that. <laughs> Follow me. The whole criminal gang. <laughs> Just wait there. So everybody got a single cell to themselves, like the one we walked past with a bed. Not a very comfortable bed, solid metal. Um, prisoners, uh, there would have been no glass in the windows, so plenty of fresh air. Uh, prisoners got a delightful outfit of clothes to wear, like the one I'm modelling today. Uh, they got food three times a day. Not very nice food. Bread, potatoes, gruel. They were also given access to medical care. Now, all these things together meant that death from disease in prison was radically reduced. Now, the authorities did not want their prisons to become overrun with poor people committing petty crimes just to get a roof over their head for a few nights. And so this is one of the reasons they introduced hard labour. Now I told you earlier about the capstan wheel. There were various other forms of hard labour, including shot drill, where you would be given a 22 pound cannonball, which you would have to carry backwards and forwards across the courtyard for absolutely no purpose, except to break your body and break your spirit. Now, the more physically demanding hard labour would be for the adult male prisoners. Ladies, you would end up with the children in the prison laundry. Not an easy option. No washing machines in those days, of course. Everything had to be done by hand. Or you could be given a task called oakum picking. And this involved being given a big, thick length of ship's rope, covered in tar, which you would have to take apart, strand by strand. This would leave the prisoner's hands blistered and bleeding. So your time in prison, you would be cold, hungry, uncomfortable, in pain, and very, very lonely, because prisoners were not allowed to speak at all during any of the time they were doing their hard labor. Now, uh, the Victorians also had a fantastic, wonderful new technology called photography. They were finally able to capture the images of their prisoners. So these pictures that we have around us, these are genuine Victorian mugshots. And they're taken in 1870, these ones. <clears throat> Excuse me. So these are some of the first ever mugshots. They do look almost artistic. And the reason for that is these pictures were taken by a portrait photographer, used to taking pictures of the gentry of Oxfordshire, the students of the university. He simply posed the prisoners in exactly the same way. 
And in this picture here, you can see our youngest ever inmate. This is Julia Ann Crumpling, aged just seven years old. A terrible crime. She stole a pram. An empty pram, no baby in it. She was playing with her dollies one day and wanted somewhere to put them. She found a pram in one of her neighbours, uh, outside one of her neighbours' front doors. She borrowed it, but she didn't ask permission and she didn't return it afterwards. So she was arrested and she was sentenced to seven days hard labour. She would have been sent to work in the prison laundry, sent back to one of those single cells on her own, all in total silence. Must have been terrifying for someone so young. But a Victorian would tell you her story is a total vindication of the system, proves it worked because she never came back. She never re-offended. She lived out her life into the 1920s in Whitney, never committed another crime. Possibly traumatised for life, but never committed another crime. Um, so we're going to go up one last set of stairs now, just to the room above us, uh, where we have our exhibition area and where I'll be leaving you today. So two more low doorways to go through, so do be very careful, especially the one at the top of these stairs. Timeline of Oxford, starting in this corner over here with the birth of the town, going all the way around the room to the Civil War over in that corner. Through this doorway opposite, you can see through to a wing of the prison. From here, it still looks very much like a Victorian prison, but it is actually now a hotel. This is the Malmaison Hotel. People still pay money to spend the night in a prison cell. I believe the rooms are a lot nicer inside than they used to be. <laughs> uh, through the middle doorway here, this is the old hospital wing of the prison. Through there, you can try out some Victorian hard labour for yourselves. You can also see the inside of our padded cell. Now, the padded cell has a bit of a jump shock inside, so do make sure you send somebody brave in first. If you continue to the end of the exhibition, you'll find a set of stairs. One flight down and turn to your right, you'll be able to make your escape. You'll be able to see your mugshots, find out what crimes you committed and what sentences you were given. Uh, you are welcome to revisit the crypt downstairs, the cells, and of course the exhibition up here, but not please St George's Tower. We need to know it's in there for safety purposes. Please do leave us reviews, uh, Google, Facebook, TripAdvisor. If you've enjoyed the tour, my name is John. And if you haven't, I'm a nameless Victorian ghost and it's all been a ghastly nightmare. So uh, thank you very much for your attention today and enjoy the rest of your time here in Oxford. Thank you very much. Whoa, there's only room for one in here, so don't crowd me, as I know more about this prison than anyone alive. This, uh, this here cell is rather special. Let me demonstrate. Let's pretend that I'm going to lose my temper, tear the cell apart with my bare hands, holler my head clean off, give you a raving headache. So just imagine that the guard has followed us. Come in, Dave. Right, Miss Kim. So, can I make a racket? Of course not. <laughs> Apart from being soundproof, she's as smooth as silk. No sharp corners, no lumps and bumps on which to tarnish my good looks. And don't go getting ideas about tunneling you out with a toothpick nonsense. That's for the movies. Behind here is a tight band of steel mesh. And what's even more remarkable is the speed in which it was built. 10 days, 10. Why? Because at short notice, it had to hold a particularly nasty specimen. Head of the Black Panther. Well, it was 40 years ago now. Well, I got the phone, the phone with me. A year long reign of terror in the 1970s. Donald Nielsen horrified the nation. So vicious. He was in a class of his own. And that's why he spent the months of his trial in this secure cell. He got four life sentences. 
They wouldn't want someone like that getting loose, would you? How do I know all this? We've heard the expression, fools could talk. 